this was going to be what I felt was the biggest fire we were ever going to face. It was really a, a punch to the gut when I heard on the radio, you know, we have multiple structures burning on and they would give a name of a street that I've heard for 25 years as part of the city that I serve. That's kind of when it began and then for the next three or four hours, I mean, every few minutes, you just heard more reports of you know, multiple structures here, multiple structures there. And for a firefighter, that's just the, that's the worst. Around 6.30 on December 4th, I was um, actually picking up my daughter. There was a council meeting that night, actually to install the new mayor, um, but my daughter, a freshman in high school, had qualified for a very high level swimming competition in Iowa, and she was leaving at 4 a.m. on the morning of the 5th. We were gonna have a family dinner, my wife, daughter, and I, and, and uh, celebrate her accomplishment, and, and then get her to bed and see her off very early in the morning to LAX. Right when I was in my car, I got the notification and I heard the call go out for a fire in Santa Paula. Respond to reports of a brush fire, 1681 Dickinson Drive, Cross Cemetery, Connecticut. Picture at top 20. This is going to be the area of Thomas Aquinas College, Smith Fountain, Santa Paula, Ohio. Picture at the engine 20. This will be closer to Thomas Aquinas. We'll update the location. The winds were amazing that night unprecedented. A massive wildfire roaring through these foothills, overnight recording wind gusts up to 68 miles per hour. This is the biggest problem, the wind shifts. Blasting fiery embers down the street, electrical lines going up in flames, and this home decimated. I knew that this was night number one of a five-night event, and so knowing that the fire had begun, I was hoping it wouldn't turn into what it did turn into, so I changed my priorities and got my daughter home safely and apologized to her and said, I will not be joining you tonight for family dinner. Please be safe, please be smart, and um, have a great time, and I will see you later. And I turned right back around and headed right back to the, uh, our headquarters to um, open our EOC and to get the, get the night rolling, because I knew within about that first hour, um, just from the radio communications and the updates, that this had an extreme potential to um, slam into our city. Operations I see our fires now at about eight to 10,000 acres, still being pushed by 50 to 60 mile an hour, strong northeast winds. Please make notification to County OES that we definitely want to expand that evacuation to the edge of the city of Ventura. Fire could very easily be pushing into the city of Ventura and residences, potential impacts to the city of Ventura within two hours. What we thought was hours turned into just a couple hours, turned into 90 minutes, you know, as the time kept getting shorter as I was listening to the radio of when it was going to hit East Ventura, not if, it was actually coming. We've trained for this, we have regional partners, we have plans, we do a lot of work together ahead of these events. This was just a much bigger one, obviously, and had a lot more potential. I made all the necessary phone calls that I have to make. So I had very early contacted uh, Assistant Chief Matt Brock. I said, did you hear what's going on? Are you aware of it? Um, he was at home in Santa Paula when I first called him and he got the ball rolling, and then I actually had sent text messages to a whole bunch of people at the city council meeting who were installing our brand new mayor, Neil Andrews, and I had texted uh, city manager, assistant city manager that night, Dan Peronick, but we also had a retiring city manager, and basically said, uh, fire in Santa Paul, extreme potential, and I'll update you as soon as I have more information. I think I just started for me to just establish priorities of what we needed to do. From a fire chief perspective, when I uh, signed the dotted line way back when, um, I signed up to be a firefighter out in the field. And so this was going to be what I felt was the biggest fire we were ever gonna face here in the city as a wildfire goes. And my first instinct was not to report to a building to stay inside. My, my instincts and my gut and my heart were, I need to get out there and make a difference. And uh, that wasn't my job. My job was to work with the management group, work with the city leaders and the other city departments to make sure we took care of the entire city as a whole. That night, a lot of eyes were on me um, in the EOC saying, like, what is the status of this thing and what do we have to prepare for? 
we had a total department call back. People were coming in. I mean, I don't even think we needed to call back our department. Anyone who knew just came in and said, I'm, I'm gonna get on a piece of equipment. Earlier that night, right before I actually even made it back to the EOC, I pulled the pin that I never thought I'd pull. And I texted uh, Dan Peronick and I said, we need to completely empty the hillsides. 100% of it needs to be evacuated immediately. We can't wait. He didn't doubt me for one second. He said, you got it. And I, he was already working with Chief Corney, who was working with Sheriff Dean. So between law and fire, we were obviously a little bit busy <laughs> fighting the fire. We sent units initially, like we always do, out to Santa Paula. That's how we work in this county, is we, we completely erase jurisdictional lines to help one another, uh, which I think was a huge benefit prior to this fire, because we do it so often. I talked uh, directly in first person with uh, County Fire Chief Mark Lorenzen. He called me, and that was a conversation we had. He said, I'm just making sure you're aware of the potential, just making sure you're aware, are you listening? And I said, absolutely, and Mark and I are friends. Um, so I said, you bet. I said, I'm almost back to the EOC now, and I'm pulling the plug with everything else we've got to, to empty the entire hillside um, on the east end of town. And so he said, you know, good move, I'll talk to you in a little bit. And a lot of these conversations lasted 30 seconds, maybe 45 seconds. So there wasn't a whole lot of wasted time on the phone. It was just, are you aware? Yes, or are we good? Yes. Hang up, keep moving. It seemed almost immediate. And then you started hearing reports from the crews in the field of, you know, the first time I heard it, I mean, it was really a, a punch to the gut. When I heard on the radio, you know, we have multiple structures burning on, and they would give a name of a street that I've heard for 25 years as part of the city that I serve. And that's kind of when it began. And then for the next three or four hours, every few minutes, you just heard more reports of you know, multiple structures here, multiple structures there. And for a firefighter, that's just the, that's the worst. I mean, you know, we, we don't like a single structure fire. <laughs> We'll fight it if it happens, but to hear that in your hometown was just surreal and you'd hear the addresses or the intersections where they were saying it. And you knew that all we had in this county were ourselves. We had the agencies that provide service within Ventura County all coming in, but when you reach outside the county, it's not just a, they, can, they can't just drop everything and go. There, there's a process, there's an ordering point, there's, which is understandable, um, but it takes time. So you just know they're not gonna be there in the next 20, 45 minutes, hour, two hours, depending on how far out, and we reached far. The incident commander, um, chief officer from County Fire, I think initially ordered 350 engines, was like one of the first orders of this is what we need. You know, and that's a big order, but it was extremely appropriate from someone who I've worked alongside um, with Chief Chad, Chad Cook, and I've worked alongside Chad for my career, really, and, uh, he's amazing. He's a tactician, he's a strategist, and he's operationally just fantastic. And he's calm and cool, but that night, I mean, he just matter of fact, I heard him on the radio and said, you know, we've got about 90 minutes before this slams the east end of Ventura City. I want to make sure we're very clear on our evacuations into the city of Ventura. We have the potential with these winds to have a very large threat along the eastern perimeter. When Chad said that, I, you know, again, you trust these people, you've worked with them for decades. There was no doubt in my mind that it was coming. And so hearing his order, hearing some of his observations, uh, and all my colleagues, we all work together. And when we hear that, we trust one another. And so um, we knew. So that was a lot of the messaging I was passing on to my colleagues in the, in the city departments, as well as city manager, assistant city manager, who was passing it on to council, to our city council. Okay, I'll skip the next agenda. Let me just fill you in real quick. I've been getting a couple of texts throughout the evening. There was a fire that started up in the Thomas Aquinas area, burning fairly aggressively. Uh, there's been some evacuations in Sao Paulo. We've just recently evacuated, opened our EOC. So if you saw your department heads leave, it's not because uh, they weren't interested in congratulating the mayor, but uh, we have opened our EOC. They're looking at doing some evacuations in the Andalondo Clearpoint area. Uh, that's why I let um, uh, Councilmember Nasarenko know that he probably needed to head out real quick too. Uh, I apologize, I don't have more information to share. We'll have information hopefully soon. Uh, we'll get that information uh, to you as soon as we can, but it uh, sounds like a pretty quickly evolving um, fire and, and situation. So. For the next three to four hours, it was, I mean, game on as far as the EOC. It was very different for me um, managing an emergency like that. That was a fire. I mean, that's the core of what I chose to do as a career, and I was in a building. 
um, till about, I think I made it until about 2.30 in the morning or 3. And I finally said to the city manager, Mark Watkins, I said, I, I, I have to get out. I have to get out. I mean, I was emotional at the time. And I said, um, I have to get out. And he said, okay, I'll come with you. I said, great, let's go. So when we walked outside, just even just getting outside the building, and it was overwhelming. The sounds, the darkness of the city, there was a total power outage. So there wasn't a light on anywhere. So it's pitch black, and the only illumination was from the fire. And then the fire illuminated the smoke, and it was just the most unbelievable and devastating sight, sound, smell. You feel the wind I'd ever felt. And so we hopped in the car and we drove and we probably were out for, we were out for a while. And we went everywhere from the far, far, far west end of the city to Vista Del Mar Hospital and then made our way back east all the way to the hillside neighborhoods here in the city. You were looking at something that absolutely wouldn't process in your brain. You were looking at it, but it didn't make any sense. And it was buildings that I've passed my whole career here, from single homes to apartment complexes to mental health hospital, and they're on fire. And we drove around and we ran into Sheriff Jeff Dean, um, Chief Corney, all just trying to get a grasp of really where we were and what we had to deal with. When I got back from that drive was the first moment that I really um, I went into my office and I shut the door and I just kind of sat down and that was my first moment where I think I really, I was extremely afraid of a couple things. I, I knew we had lost civilian life. Um, just seeing that intense devastation, the ferocity of, of, of the fire itself, how quickly it was moving and taking structures how desperately we needed more resources there. We were eight weeks post Santa Rosa. And uh, in my mind, I, I knew we had lost civilian life. I just didn't know how much. And I knew that our firefighters, I say our, all the firefighters involved, no matter what agency, whatever patch they're wearing, this was home. And they were going to push harder, go farther, and work longer than maybe even they should. Um, and they're hard workers to begin with. And I, my other fear was that we were going to lose a firefighter or a police officer or a sheriff that night. Um, a, a true, deep fear for me that I held on to pretty much quietly that night. And um, I've never had a sunrise like the morning of the 5th because the first call I made was to Chief Brock. And I just said, just give it to me straight. What do we have as far as loss like that? And um, we, we had confirmed that we lost a civilian in a traffic collision. But I, um, I said, you know, what about the fire area? Have we heard people missing? Have we found anything? Or did people, I mean, seriously, you know, um, get overtaken by the fire running from their homes? I, I just didn't know. I hadn't gone up all the way up. And um, he said, no, right now, I mean, we're not getting anything like that. And he was reporting back from the unified command post. So we had law, fire, I mean, we had everybody there. And I said, what about accountability for fire, for law? And he said, everyone's accounted for. That we, can, that we know is here, they're all accounted for. I confirmed that with him probably four or five times. And uh, that, was my, that was my official moment where I went in my office and you know, I, uh, I had a miniature little breakdown there and of, of truly of relief. The emotions just kind of came out and that was my first real, you know, that's my family. That's my... Uh, those are the people I'm responsible for. Even if I'm not out there, those, th I'm responsible to send those folks home to their spouses, their children, their parents. And uh, it was uh, an incredible, incredibly emotional moment to know how hard they had worked, even in those first 12 hours. It went on for days, as we all know. I mean, the active firefight went on for days and days and days in the city. To know that they were okay and had survived a night where I'm sure they've worked harder than they ever have before, that was really the moment for me, I mean, I think, where I was so thankful for life and for the preservation of life, not just of the communities, but of, of our own. And uh, that was, uh, 
yeah, that was a big moment for me in the fire, was the, was the morning of the 5th. And then I rejoiced in that by diving right back in. Took a brief moment to myself, and then it was right back in the mix. I was in the EOC for that first week. We don't have backups for ourselves. You know, there's really only one fire chief. I have one assistant fire chief in Matt Brock. Our battalion chiefs were all deployed and had entire divisions up on the fire with multiple strike teams assigned to each of them. They had all come in from off-duty, obviously. And so that week of the 4th, I think the first time I tried to get home was Saturday. And uh, I had set up a military cot in my office. I won't say I went to sleep. I think I went until I couldn't stay awake. And then I passed out for an hour or two just to rejuvenate enough and popped right back up. And a lot of people said, have you, have you gone home? You know, I said, no. <laughs> That's why I look this way and probably why I smell this way. And I hadn't even taking the time to make it over to a station, you know, even just to catch something as simple as a shower to most people. It was just a matter of uh, staying engaged at the EOC and making sure everything was still moving forward, you know. Really the press conferences were the only time I got rest because I stood behind the, uh, the main speakers and People said, I saw you on TV and it looked like you were falling asleep, like you were sleeping standing up. And I said, I probably was. A lot of emotion those first couple of days of just the potential, you know, but then having an outcome where Santa Rosa was just hit so hard and I didn't see us being any different. And so when we came out the next morning and, you know, as far as the fire area was concerned, you know, we hadn't lost any civilians on the street or in homes. and. Our first responders were okay. It was a, I mean, just such a huge, huge weight to remove that we could now focus on property preservation and, you know, which was obviously, again, I mean, I can't even begin to address the catastrophe that that was, but, um, you know, life came first. You can't rebuild life. It is what we do. This was to a bigger level. These crews have all been on brush fires, wildfires, destructive fires, just like this one, just not here. And they've put themselves in harm's way and they've done that, uh, it just wasn't here. They're gonna push themselves a little farther into that inferno and stay there for a little longer and take a little more risk when it's your home. This is the city they've committed to protect when they're here. But I think it's training, it's preparation, it's grit, and it's having the confidence that you have the equipment and the team to do it. And I think that can't be stated enough. You've got to believe in the team that you're entering that environment with and know that your fire captains, your fire engineers, your firefighter paramedics are all competent, ready, geared up, safe, equipped, trained, and the battalion chiefs and the chief officers that are commanding the larger areas and the neighborhoods have to have confidence in those teams that, that are working for them. And I think something of this magnitude just begs that question a little bit more because people saw it firsthand. You know, if it's a structure fire in a single home on a single block in the middle of the night, people come out, they'll watch it, not understanding that the firefighters inside that building are in an enclosed area completely surrounded by fire that's growing and you know they've they've faced things that I said a lot of people I mean can't just truly can't imagine this was just on a much more recognizable scale so it seems a lot more intense but you know to me that is the life of a firefighter there's training there's camaraderie, there's preparation, there's equipment, there's drilling for that moment. But when that moment comes, it all just goes into play and it's what they signed up for. Nobody, no one looks for disaster, but when it happens, they wanna be there and they wanna be the ones making a difference in their community. And I think that's why you take a job like this is, you know, if we can get through without ever, without, without medical emergencies, fires, floods, debris flows, anything, we'd love to, but statistics say otherwise. And they want to be there to serve their community when those calls come. Conditions presented themselves that night where I know um, a couple times they had to basically pull back even if it was for 8, 10, 12 minutes because it was way too intense and they probably would have lost first responders. And even that 8, 10, 12 minutes, they hated it. They hated it, but they were smart enough to make that decision to know what good are we if we're not here because we're injured or hurt or worse? 
so they knew when to, you know, tactically withdraw and then re-engage immediately and make the greatest difference for the greatest number of homes they could. And they just did that non-stop for about the first 36 hours of this fire. It's vital that we train and know one another, not just in our city, at our six stations, but throughout this county. Familiar names, voices, faces, that you work with these people day in and day out. You train with these people. We have a joint academy with Ventura County Fire we have for decades. You know these people so that when you're on a street, there's not this unfamiliarity, you know. And of course, we all speak a universal language because you saw 8,000 people show up and we didn't hand out a how to fight fire in Ventura flyer. They knew what they were doing the second they pulled up. We spoke the same language. We work under the same incident command principles where our verbiage is the same, our communications are the same. I mean, that's the testament to the culture of knowing what you're doing beforehand is we had 8,000 people show up, really from 22 states. And we all went to work and we had a lot of assistance. Our total force, as far as field personnel, is 66 people who cover three different shifts. So on any given day, there's 22 that are on duty. We had a lot more help than what our whole department could provide on any given day um, here and throughout the county. Obviously, it marched right through here, and it kept going. From my vantage point, we learned, honestly, that we do it right here in Ventura County. And I say that with a lot of pride. The work we've done just during my career to get beyond the, I call it the logo or the patch. We fire chiefs now, especially since I've been the chief of this department, I've worked with the chiefs of all the departments, but the three largest service areas are Oxnard City, Ventura City, and then the County Fire Protection District. And we all agree that if someone is in need of help and they happen to be 400 yards in your jurisdiction, it shouldn't be that they're deprived of the closest help um, simply because of the patch on our sleeve. And so we agree to drop borders and send the closest available unit based on GPS. And so that's one thing is the initial responses to any call, especially a fire like this, were the closest resources available to try and capture this as soon as possible. And that's from a, a unified dispatch center run by the district that we are dispatched from, so is Oxnard, everyone is from the same place and we've worked together so well for so many years that when it hit, it was like one unified department throughout the county. And I think the other takeaway is the understanding of those outside of the fire service has increased for what we do, for what makes us nervous. Everything from brush clearance and a fire prevention side to the fire suppression side of exactly what it takes to put out a fire. I think a lot of times, culturally, the house is on fire, the community might say, wow, you have a big hook and ladder truck and three or four of those engines. Does it really take that much to put out a fire on one house? And it does. And so you can only imagine multiplying that by hundreds. And that's why it took 8,000 to get here. Fire is a, a very difficult um, entity to beat if it gets away. And uh, it ran on December 4th. My other takeaway, which I've said over and over, was a community that listened. The neighborhoods and the residents were asked to leave. They left. They left. We didn't have people fighting us. We didn't have people. I mean, I'm sure some people, if I picked it apart to a granular level, I'm sure people would have resisted. But overall, we were so fortunate um, to get that many people out as quickly as they did. We didn't physically take people. They complied. And that undoubtedly had an impact on the fact that we didn't lose any life. I think the other takeaway for me was communication. Just even though we tried, a lot of times we fell short initially of giving the community information when we wouldn't allow them to go back up to their neighborhoods, you know, and I understand that. People don't know if their home is standing, not standing, and we were the ones between they and their home. There were a few times when I spoke at the community meetings and the town hall meetings where I said, I am more than happy to take that on my shoulders. And I said, I would rather have a room full of you very upset with me for not lifting the evacuation or saying you can go back than any of you that are up there and tomorrow you're not because something flares up or something burns and you're not okay simply because I didn't do my job. Conditions change here in the city of Ventura. We're still in an active firefight. 
I know that's very hard to grasp when all the fire and all the news are in Santa Barbara and the outskirts of Fillmore. Ventura is not out of the woods, and it's my job to stand in front of you and take those barbs and put a bullseye on me, that I will take that responsibility to keep you safe because I would rather have an auditorium full of relatively frustrated individuals who are safe to be upset than anyone who's going to get hurt. And I'll take that on my shoulders any day of the week, and I want to keep our civilian statistics down to zero. And people were thankful for that, you know, so I think communication back to the community is huge. You have to let people know what's going on. I think we did a great job, but I don't think you can ever over-communicate. City leadership really stepped up. It was immediate. It's that teamwork on all levels, on, you know, not just fire, not just law, um, not the city departments, you know, public works, parks, I mean, the finance, city attorney, HR, I mean, everybody was involved. The city family was just incredible. There were people there 24-7 that whole week from all the different departments who shed any ID badge they had. They don't care what department they work for. They're like, we are here for the city, what do you need? Those police officers who put themselves in that environment without their protective equipment that we wear or having the fire engine itself, they're in a patrol car driving through this inferno. That's what was amazing to see. You know, we kind of signed up to put the badge on that said, we'll do this. And, but everyone else who didn't necessarily sign up to be a disaster worker became one, willingly. And um, they, were, they were there for us if we needed them. And I couldn't be more proud of our department, our city, our city departments, law enforcement, and then the communities around us. It's a testament to how we function out here, especially in California, you know, with, with our mutual aid system. It's, over the many years, we'll send one or two engines out when there's another disaster somewhere else. It paid us back. I, can't, I don't even know how many times over. One or two engines out for a week or two over all these years, and that same system is what sent 8,000 folks our way. So I always say family first. I tell all my firefighters, family first. Knowing that your family is safe was huge for me. My daughter, she knows her dad, and so before I walked out the door, she grabbed me, and this is where, you know, you know they go, they're, they're so much more mature than you ever want to believe. And she said, I know you, and I know you're worried about me flying and traveling and being out of state for five days. And she said, let's make a deal. And she said, I will do everything right. I will watch my back. I will lock my doors. I will be safe. I will keep my head on a swivel so you don't have to worry about me if you do the same thing so I don't have to worry about you. And, you know, that's the moment where as a dad you kind of, you know you did something right. So when she said that, I said, okay, it's a deal. It was a lot off my shoulders that my daughter was safe with her friends, a good environment where she wasn't worrying about what was happening. It truly could have been just disastrous compared to how it did, um, given the circumstances. So it took me a while to actually bite off on that. Um, but I got there talking to members of the community, to be honest, at the town hall meetings. And I mean, I had people coming up and hugging me who lost their home. And I said, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And, and uh, but they didn't look at it like it was anyone's fault, you know, and, and um, they were just thankful that they got away with their lives and that the firefighters were able to do what they did.